Good evening, my brothers and sisters in the risen Lord. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Brotherhood of the Apostolic Teaching for allowing us to be together, the listeners, the viewers, and myself, so that we may discuss one of the central doctrines that we have in the Holy Church, and that is incarnational theology. Throughout this presentation, I will focus on certain important aspects of this teaching. I'm going to, first of all, discuss the purpose of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I will give a short history and introduction of the incarnation within salvation history. I will discuss the role of Mary, the mother of God. We call her the Theotokos. And then we are going to speak briefly about the divine person of the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And the last part will be some conclusions concerning these four features that will be the topic of my presentation. It will be conclusions that come from the church fathers and from some important aspects of relating to this doctrine. What is the purpose of the incarnation? We understand when we read the book of Genesis that God created heaven and earth and then the crown of creation was creating the human person out of nothing. But we understand in the book of Genesis that the human person, Adam and Eve, made a choice, a decision to be separated from God. And we also understand throughout the salvation history that God wished through his love that he would come down to embrace and to bring the human person to restore the fellowship between him and the person who is isolated and separated from him. It is in this regard that we begin to talk about the incarnation. God has taken upon himself our fallen human nature and embraced it to his divinity. The human person who bled because of the state of sin, now he is in need of a new blood to restore his health and to bring life into his being. And that is what we understand by the original sin that it generated this spiritual bleeding and in the incarnation of our Lord we begin to see the restoration of the power and of the beauty 
And all distortion that took place in the incarnation from the time of the creation of the human person now is given the opportunity to be on its way of full restoration. In the words of the second century saint, Saint Irenaeus of Leon, he says, God became man so that man may become God by grace. To go back to the book of Genesis, we understand that because of rebelliousness, sin entered into the world, into the human person. Adam wanted to make himself as God to be separated from his creator. As a result of that, he became the prisoner of his ego, his own self-interest. God wanted to restore the fellowship between the creator and the creatures. And we understand even that from the book of Genesis, that Adam was commissioned as a partner to even name all the creatures as if it was a calling and a mission to realize that by applying his gifts and power and life that he will continue to be created as he was originally in the image and likeness of God. But then through rebelliousness, we begin to see that the devil came and he brought that distortion into the life of the human person by disobeying God and by telling him that he can be God by his own way and to be separated from the almighty creator. In one of the services, especially in the matins of the feast of the Annunciation of the Mother of God, the church sings a praise as follows. The hymn says, Today the great mystery is revealed, which is given before all ages. The Son of God becomes the Son of Man, so that by God, who is coming from above, prepares himself and to become united with the lower. Adam, who was disappointed in the old that he was not able to be God by his own as he desired, then God became man so that Adam may become God by grace. This is the hymn that is recited on the matin service of the Feast of the Annunciation. And so, my beloved, we begin to understand that God made a decision. He wanted to be united. The unlimited God becomes united with our limited nature. He is the creator and simply by becoming united with the nature of the creation, he was able to heal our arrogance and pride by coming down and he lifted us up so that we do not just simply become God by nature, but we share in his love we share in his glory, in his power, in his wisdom, and in his great sanctification. Now we can participate in the divine energies as the 14th century father of the church, St. Gregory Palamas had indicated that we can embrace and become united 
with these eternal and divine energies. It is, in another word, a similar interpretation of the second epistle of Peter, verse 1 and chapter 1, verse 2, where we are called by the incarnation to become partners of the divine nature, again by grace. How did this incarnation begin in terms of preparing the human person into this great intervention of the divine in the life of the human person? In the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, verses 9 and 10, again we hear the words of the evangelist that the love of God has appeared among us. So God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we may become alive by him. It is established, it is based on this love, not because we made the initiative but it is God who made that initiative himself. He loved us by sending us his son as a ransom for our own sins and transgressions. My beloved in the risen Lord, let us understand that God's love is not something that can be imposed on us. We have to show a synergy the human person has to accept God's invitation and God's initiative and God's divine love. And in this regard, we see that the Old Testament plays as the arena in which this preparation takes place. And in this regard, I would like to make four suggestions in this type of preparation. First of all, we have what we consider in the Old Testament as the laws, the law of Moses. We understand again in Galatians 3 that the laws are inspired by God. The laws are our teacher they guide us into Christ. In this regard, we understand the Mosaic law not to be interpreted legalistically, but to be based on our understanding of the law that God has inspired us and told us that the entire law is based on our love for God and our love for our neighbor. We understand also the Ten Commandments in that light, where the purpose is not by our Lord to tell us what we can do, what we cannot do. Eternal life goes beyond these commandments because the very purpose of such commandments, they are the words that are given to us by God as a way to discipline the morality of the human person so that they can become entitled and worthy to enter into the kingdom of God. On the other hand, we have some events in the Old Testament, some historical events that must be interpreted not symbolically or allegorically, but only in the understanding of the church as being a type that is being fulfilled. It is typology. In this regard, we can appreciate the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was kidnapped by his brothers and then later sold to the merchants and ended up going into Egypt. Despite all the difficulties that he encountered, he is regarded by the Old Testament story of Joseph 
that he was the savior of the world because he was able to use his own administration and wisdom so that he may save those who were subject to the drought that took place during that time. He became the savior of the world and the one who provided bread to those people, whether they were in Egypt or beyond Egypt. And it is in this type of typology, my friends, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Lord, becomes that heavenly bread that brings all that kind of nourishment and the gaining of eternal life. On the other hand, we have the story of Moses. Again, Moses ended up being in Egypt, and he is regarded as the one who brought the Hebrews and became the inspiration and the source of their salvation from slavery. He is the one who led them into the promised land as bringing salvation to those who continued to believe in his leadership. And it was a way to overcome devil and the slavery that they had encountered in the land of Egypt. Thirdly, my beloved, we have what we consider as the type of preparation through the prophets. In the Old Testament, we understand that prophets played an important role in the life of God-man relationship. Prophets, gave, they gave that kind of initiative reminding people about what God wants them to do. They, each and every one of them, based on the issues that they were discussing, said to the people, thus says the Lord, to return to God and to understand his ways and the things that the Lord wants them to do and to overcome any kind of temptation and to separate themselves from any vain glory and to return to him in repentance. The prophets also play a very important word in terms of the prophecies that they had concerning the incarnation of the Son of God. For instance, up in the 8th century before the nativity of our Lord, it was in the prophecy of Isaiah, as we hear the, that the Lord Jesus Christ will be coming from the sect, from the race of David. He is given that name as the son of David. He is also the same prophet who in the seventh chapter, verse 14, talks about the miraculous birth of the Lord when he says that the virgin shall conceive and shall give birth a son. His name shall be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. In the prophecy of Micah, and that is again from the 8th century, some 800 years before the birth of our Lord, we are talking about the birthplace even of our Savior. When he talks about Bethlehem, he says, and you Bethlehem, even though you are a minor village in the land of Israel, from you shall emerge a Savior who will overcome the house of Israel. And again, we are talking about Isaiah, who in his prophetic words talked about the suffering servant, the savior of our Lord, and that is in his 53rd chapter. Even until today, 
when the church prepares the bread and the wine to be later transformed into the body and blood of our Lord during the divine liturgy, there we remember these verses that come from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Now we come to the third aspect of the uh, incarnational theology. We said earlier that whatever God wants, even though he may take the initiative because he is the one who loves mankind, nevertheless, we talk about synergy. We talk about cooperation. We talk about human response to this action that has been gifted mankind. And that is the role of the mother of God Mary. In the epistle of the feast of the nativity of our Lord, we read from Galatians that when the time became fulfilled, God sent his only begotten son born of a woman. This is again in the words of Saint Paul. We understand from the life of Mary even though we do not have that much in the four Gospels that are contained in the New Testament, nevertheless, we are talking about the unwritten tradition in the Holy Church where we understand a few things about what took place in the life of Mary, that we understand that all that type of holiness of the Old Testament has come to being fulfilled and reaching the summit of faith, of humility, and obedience to God in the person of Mary. In the first chapter of Luke, when Mary was visited by the archangel Gabriel, she said the following, I am the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be according to your words. She did not brag about it. She did not consider herself as something special in her own eyes, that she was now can talk to people and tell them, here I am. Nevertheless, the action that the mother of God has done was the response of her will, of her faith, as if she was participating and working together to fulfill that divine dispensation initiated by God. In this regard, in the words of Ezekiel chapter 44, we understand that the mother of God, that virgin, becomes, as he says in his prophecy, that gate that is directed towards the east, and the Lord is coming from the east through that gate. The mother of God, therefore, is the one who brought Christ into the universe, as we say on the day of her nativity, one of the major feast days that we have for the mother of God, that she is the one who brought into the universe the salvation of our own souls. In Mary, therefore, this union between God and man had taken place. And in the writings of the fathers of the ecumenical council in Ephesus, she is regarded as that virgin being the mother of God because she had given birth to the incarnate God. And that is something that she, in the words of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, when mother of God came to visit her, she says, what kind of a great honor that I have that the mother of my Lord will come to me. 
in the liturgical tradition of the Holy Church and especially in the divine liturgy of Saint Basil the Great, we define that the Mother of God in her conception giving birth to Jesus Christ, that her belly has become broader than the heavens and the court. And so we have to understand that the Mother of God has nothing to do when we come to the understanding of the Holy Trinity. We talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the Mother of God is not part of that Trinity, or even some may indicate that she is the fourth person of that group. The Mother of God, as we understand in the scriptures, especially in the Gospels, she always remained behind the scene. Even in the first miracle that our Lord performed by changing the water into wine, all the mother had to do was to say, listen to him, whatever he tells you, do it. But nevertheless, we have to understand that this will be probably another topic that we will discuss, that the mother of God represents the compassion of a mother who can feel and experience our needs, and therefore her intercession becomes a power for us that we can embrace because she is the one that brought and she gave us that kind of union that we have by having brought the son and was united through her and brought him into the world. And that is the reason, again, I don't want to separate the topic of the incarnation in this regard, but to also indicate that even in the iconography of the church, when we paint the icon of the Mother of God, it is uh, one of the strange things that we do when we say we are writing icons. That should not be the case. We should still insist on painting icons, and through that painting, we are doing something similar as if the words that are used, the letters that are used in the scriptures, now it is the colors that we use to paint the icon. So when we have the icon of the Mother of God, as we have it on the iconostasis, that is not just an, uh, the Mother of God alone, but with her son. It is the icon called Christ the Child, compared to the one that we have on the right-hand side of the royal door. It is Christ the Teacher. So in the tradition of the Holy Church, the Mother of God is not, is not, I say it again, written uh, or painted by uh, the, the Mother of God alone. Even the icon of the Annunciation, it is a depiction of the Mother of God with the Archangel giving her the message. Now, the last topic that I would like to come back into it, to try now to understand because of this presentation, how do we come to view and understand the divine person of Jesus Christ in the words of Saint Athanasius and Saint Cyril as being the incarnate Lord, the incarnate Lord that is uh, given, which means as we understand it, uh, that means God saves. Because again, in the indication in the first chapter of Matthew verse 21, the angel says, he shall save and deliver his people from all his sins. We have to understand that Jesus Christ has two natures, divine 
and human. And these two natures are united in one divine person, the person of the incarnate God who is Jesus Christ. And in the attributes that are given to this union, huh? Put down the paper. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And in the attributes that are given to the incarnate Lord, we say that this unity, this union, is without any division, without any separation, without any change or any mixture. What does that mean? It means, first of all, that the divine nature does not lose its important qualities and neither does the human nature losing any of its qualities. Jesus Christ is a perfect God and a perfect human being. Why is it so? Because if Jesus Christ is divine and God only, then we will come to the conclusion as some of the heretics have come to that conclusion that the humanity of Jesus Christ is nothing but some sort of a dream or some sort of a fantasy or Christ being nothing but his humanity is nothing but a ghost. And that means that the divine element will not enter into the essence of the human nature in order to be sanctified and to be saved. On the other hand, if Christ is nothing but a good, nice human person only, then how can we say that a human person will become and create that bridge that brings humanity into that divine life? And therefore, this unity, this union between the two natures become the cornerstone of our own spiritual life. We become united in God by grace without being dissolving our humanity into the divine nature. And therefore, we do not get eliminated the relationship between the creature and the creator becomes maintained. And this is, my friends, is one of the issues that we, the church, encountered between the fourth and the fifth century between two major heresies. One was the Arian heresy in the words of Arius, who was a priest that came from Alexandria. And this priest said that there was a time where the divine Jesus Christ was not. He was not. It means that he was a human person, that he was nothing but a human person, and the divine nature was poured upon him and left him when he was crucified and as far as Arius's Mariology is concerned he considered that the mother of God was nothing but the mother of Christ and the Christ is one of those human names that Christ had as we will talk about that in the next conclusion. On the other hand, we have in the fifth century the heresy of Nestorius who said that the divine nature was so great and immense that it dissolved that human nature and that led later on some of the other heresies to talk about that, which was again uh, defended 
by the Holy Church in the Fourth Ecumenical Council in 451, defeating the, these heresies, and it was the heresy of Nestorius and Utica as well. And therefore, we have to come to some understanding that our Lord was born as a child, and he was born of the Virgin Mary, and our Lord Jesus Christ, by his incarnation, went through all stages of human life. From infancy being a child, born in Bethlehem, and then growing and beginning his preaching and teaching, and ultimately reaching into the city of Jerusalem to be arrested, to be given a political and a spiritual judgments, ultimately led him to be crucified, to be buried, and ultimately to be resurrected for us and for our salvation. He talked to us as a God. And when he said that I and the Father are one, and that is in John 10, 30. And he said, give reminding his disciples on his way to ascend in glory to meet him in a certain place. So that reminding them that as he had promised them, he shall go. He said, I will go to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He did not say that I am going back to our father. And that is the distinction that our Lord has indicated by saying to my father and your father. In fact, my beloved, when we talk about Jesus Christ as the son of God, this is the reason that the Jews ended up crucifying him because he made himself as the Son of God, which is mentioned more than 160 times in the scriptures of the New Testament. Again, in the year 681 and in the city of Constantinople, in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, with that was again by focusing not only on the two divine and human natures, but by also the divine and human wills, that both wills are there in the divine person of Jesus Christ. And again, in the Gospel, according to St. John, our Lord, tells the Jews, I do not seek my will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And in this regard, again, we begin to understand that there are certain things that from the history of the church and from the work of the church fathers, we begin to develop these theologies and try to understand in the conclusions, I wanted to give you as references for things that you would like to, you know, follow up and to try to read and to understand how, for instance, we in the scriptures refer to Virgin Mary as the mother of God or the Theotokos. This title, which describes her place in the orthodox doctrine that Christ comes not from men, but from the Holy Spirit. He is born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. When Mary visited and greeted Elizabeth, the latter said, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed 
with a loud voice, Why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And that is chapter 1, verses 39 to 41. And so the one who was born of her is true God who took his flesh from her. In the words of St. John of Damascus from the 8th century, we can read the following uh, text. Now we do not say, as St. John continues, that God was born of her in the sense that the divinity of the word has its beginning of being from her, but in the sense that God the word himself, who was timelessly begotten of the Father before the ages and exists without beginning and eternally with the Father and the Holy Spirit, did in the last days come for our salvation to dwell in her womb and of her was without undergoing change made flesh and bone. For the Holy Virgin did not give birth to a mere man, but to a true God and not to God simply, but to God made flesh. God did not bring his body down from heaven, but assumed it from her and united himself with this body individually and undividedly in the womb of the virgin a perfect unity between divinity and humanity was accomplished the virgin did not give birth to a man who was later adopted by god as his son he who was born was truly god and truly man this is the meaning of the Theotokos. And so when we talk about the theology of Mary, which we consider as Mariology, we have to understand that it is dependent on our understanding of the theology of Jesus Christ. We call it Christology. And then again, we begin to as we read in the scriptures, we see that there are many names that are given to our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate. He is Jesus, which means Savior. The name Jesus signifies a real man, the humanity of Christ. And so we have other names such as the son of Joseph or the son of Mary. And then on the other hand, as far as him being the son of God, he is Jesus the Lord in the Greek word, the Kyrios, as we heard in the confession of St. Thomas, you are my Lord and my God. And he used that in the indefinite article, the Lord and the God. He is the son of God. And he is, this is one of the names that express the divine origin of Jesus Christ. We have to also understand that even the disciples of our Lord, prior to his crucifixion, death and resurrection, they considered Jesus Christ to be as a prince or a king. They expected him that he will come and they dreamt about a national independence that the name Christ was attributed to him as the political implication that the Lord will come and do, to restore the kingdom of Israel. We read that again in Acts 1 verse 6 as it was the expectation and the promise as, as they thought that the role of Christ was about to be that way. But then, contrary to that, in that message in the first chapter, that the new meaning of the term Christ 
became apparent as being the anointed one and revealed by Jesus himself that he is Christ who must suffer many things, but it is his free choice to suffer on the cross and it is the necessity for him to do so are both essential in the New Testament and as the concept of Christ himself. And in other sections, especially in the Gospel of St. John, we have many names that are given to our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate God. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the door of the sheep. He is all those that says, I am Eroimi, as we say in the Greek, and it stands for the divine eternal being of Jesus Christ expressing his equality with God. But we have to understand that with all the, all the attributes, all the names, all these uh, qualities that we give to our Lord, we have to know how to relate to that in terms of relating to the divine person, the second person of the Holy Trinity. In Orthodox theology, we talk about two ways of relating to the understanding of Jesus Christ, both in a negative and in a positive way. We can say he is the bread of life. He is the door. He is the fortress. He is my rock. We use all these uh, attributes, but we also have the ability to negate them. We even say Christ is the being, but we also we can negate that into the non-being because we cannot define our Lord and our God. We all have the opportunity to be united with him. He is the invisible. He is the incomprehensible. And he is the one that cannot be defined. He is not a subject to be defined, but the divine person to become united and to enter into union and communion with him. And the last third item that I wanted to indicate that the birth of God incarnate is not some sort of a drama is not something that we talk about it poetically and try to reach our own conclusions. We have to understand it as the work of God's love for the salvation of man. Let us see what St. Gregory of Nyssa, the brother of St. Basil the Great, says about the incarnation of our Lord, and he has that address on religious instructions. He says, if you exclude from life the benefits which come from God, you will have no way of recognizing the divine. It is from the blessings we experience that we recognize our benefactor, since by observing what happens to us, we deduce the nature of him who is responsible for it. If then the love of man is a proper mark of the divine nature, here is the explanation you are looking for. Here is the reason for God's presence among us. Our nature was sick and needed a doctor. Man had fallen and needed someone to raise him up. He who had lost life needed someone to restore it. He who had ceased to participate in the good needed someone to bring him back into it. He who was shut up in darkness needed the presence of life. The prisoner was looking for someone to ransom him the captive for someone to take him part. He who was under the yoke of slavery was looking for someone to set him free. Were these trifling 
and unworthy reasons to impel God to come down to visit human nature, seeing humanity was in such a pitiful and wretched state. And so we come to the last item that I needed to finish my presentation by reminding certain things again, which is basically important for the understanding of incarnational theology and how we can use that in our Holy Church. We have to know, my beloved, that even before the personal birth of the Virgin Mary as the man Jesus, the divine Son and Word of God was in the world by the presence and action in the creation itself, particularly in man. The human person is created in God's image and likeness. Jesus Christ, the divine, was present and active in the theophanies, as I said earlier, into the Old Testament, saints and prophets, and in the words of the law, and in the prophets, both oral and scriptural. And in this regard, we can say, as the church sings on the day of the nativity of our Lord, we say today the Virgin give birth to the transcendent one, not to the just the imminent that was born, but to the transcendent one, and the earth offers a cave to the unapproachable one. Angels with shepherds glorify him. The wise man journeys with the star, since for our sake the eternal God was born as a little child. This is a prayer that we use as giving a summary of what we understand the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth then is God, or more accurately, the divine Son of God in human flesh. He is a true man in every way. He was born, he grew up in obedience to his parents. He increased in wisdom and stature as we read in Luke 2 verses 51 and 52. He had a family life with brethren as we read in Mark 2 and who according to the Orthodox doctrine were not children born of Mary who is confessed as ever virgin and that is in the icon of the mother of God with Christ the child, we have the three stars on both sides of her side and on her forehead, indicating that she was virgin before, during, and after having given birth. And that also, you know, with the understanding that when we talk about the brethren of Jesus, they were either cousins or children of Joseph. As a man, Jesus experienced all normal and natural human experiences, such as growth and development and learning, hunger, thirst, fatigue, sorrow, pain, and disappointment. He also knew human temptation, suffering, and death. He took these things upon himself for us men and for our salvation. In the words of the epistle to the Hebrews, in the second chapter, 9 to 18, we read the following. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. 
for surely it was not with angels that he is concerned, but with the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in every respect to make expiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Again, that is Hebrew 2 verses 9, 18. But we have also to qualify and to understand that Christ has entered the world becoming like all men in all things except sin. In the words of 1 Peter verse uh, chapter 2 verse 22 and Hebrew 4 verse 15, we read the following. He committed no sin, no guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he trusted to him, God the Father, who judges justly. Again, though Jesus was tempted by the devil, but he did not sin. He was a perfect divine person in every way, absolutely obedient to God the Father, speaking the words, doing his works, and accomplishing his will. As a man, Jesus fulfilled his role perfectly. And that brings me to the conclusion of this presentation. And that is the reason that when we celebrate the crucifixion and the death and resurrection of our Lord, we say very clearly that Jesus Christ died by choice for our salvation and because of his love for mankind. I pray and I hope that we shall always continue to honor the triune Godhead, that we have to understand the purpose of this incarnation, not to write a drama about the divine entering our world and make it some sort of a movie picture or some sort of a poetic form of uh, ideas, but most importantly, to be a reality that we believe in, to show and express God's love for mankind. Thank you for your attention, for your uh, listening, and for viewing. And I will be very happy now if you have any questions, I'll be uh, willing to uh, respond and to answer all the questions pertaining to the topic. If there are any other topic in the future, then we will be able to, be, to do justice to them, to these uh, topics so that we do not uh, shoo words off our cuff and come to some you know conclusions that do not uh, you know show any kind of seriousness in our presentation okay okay father thank you for the uh, thorough explanation uh, we got a question you know it's a common question like they always ask the same question why did okay. god need to uh, come down and uh, incarnate like he can just with one word uh, give us forgiveness he can forgive but forgiveness as we understand in the church is uh, a one-way street but uh, if we take it uh, from uh, the uh, question that is being asked we are not uh, robots we have to respond to that forgiveness that is granted and we have to show our willingness, our synergy, and our cooperation. And that's why if God gives a word, and he has given us words, do we obey them? We have the Ten Commandments. We refer to them as being the words from God. Do we follow them? We are told to love God from our entire being. But what we do today, we say that we are created in the image and likeness of God as the scriptures tell us, but we create our own God. 
we try to make our own God the way we want him to be, and then we blame him if we make him as a monster. Some people would come and tell me, why did this plane fall killing uh, all these uh, you know, people? Why did the coronavirus come and wiped over 250,000 people on the face of the earth? We go back and see that it is, if it is God's foreknowledge of what happens in the world, whether it is the destruction or the death of a, of a plane falling or a bridge falling or anything that may happen in our own life, we have to see who is responsible to be behind that. And we have to say that God's foreknowledge of what happens does not eliminate our responsibility. We are not robots. We are not just there to, to hear the word, do it, and you we do it. I hope that life will be that simple that we can just do whatever God wants us to do. Then we would have, uh, you know, followed the Ten Commandments and, uh, you know, uh, for, fulfilled the laws of Moses and the incarnation, maybe, maybe by the uh, God's mind would have, you know, reach a point, you know, that he will... Uh, give another way in his own mind, you know, to restore mankind. But we are talking about the dispensation that is initiated by God. And therefore, we have to understand that our knowledge is important in terms of how we respond and cooperate with the divine gift. I, as a human person, may want to embrace it or reject it. And that is the plight that we have with the human beings today. In terms of our spiritual values, moral values, we have replaced all that to fit our own agenda and to do things according to our own. We pray that God again will continue to inspire us to hear his words even after him being incarnate, we still fall away from being with our Lord and we need to come back and return to him. And we do that in the Holy Church through the sacrament of forgiveness and asking for repentance. That's the opportunity that instead of being baptized into a new life, as we teach it in the Holy Church, we go back to him through repentance, through tears, so that we may be given that opportunity of being rebaptized by the tears of our repentance. Uh, thank, thank you, you Father, for your you answer. answer. I have uh, Leith from the other side on the line. He has also a question. He got it through the email. Yes, Leith, you have okay. the mic with you. Yes, okay. Father, thank you for the, for the explanation. Uh, I have two questions, actually, uh, I get. Uh, the first one is how we say that Jesus born with no origin sin while he born from a woman who was a human and has the origin sin. And the second question was, is after the resurrections, did Jesus keep his human nature? And if yes, will he keep this human nature forever or he will just leave it sometime in the future? Okay, let, let me uh, go to the second question first and move into the, the first one. The second question is, uh, we talk about the body of Jesus after the resurrection. Now, we understand that there are appearances of our risen Lord to his disciples and to the people. He talked to them and uh, they uh, witnessed the uh, risen Lord. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared as the, the two of them were going to the city of Emmaus, and he talked to them. So he was talking, and uh, he even, when he uh, appeared on the lake uh, of uh, the Genesaret, he uh, and asked the people if they had any food uh, to eat, and he shared with them fish and honeycomb. So he ate as a way to prove to them that he was not just a simple ghost. 
We understand on the eve of the resurrection that he appeared to the ten as they were in the attic, for as the Gospel of St. John says, for the fear of the people who were threatening the life of the apostles, he entered the doors while the doors were shut and invited the disciples to touch his wounds, to touch the side and to touch the uh, print of the nails. And he told them, come and touch me. I am not a ghost. And when they told Thomas, Thomas said, I do not believe that uh, Christ uh, resurrected. Uh, how could that be? There is no way that uh, anybody will be able to, uh, to be resurrected. They said, well, we saw him. And then it says a week later, as we celebrate that on St. Thomas Sunday in the Orthodox Church, Thomas was with them. The 11 were there. And Jesus again came as the doors were shut and he appeared to them and he invited Thomas to touch his wound and his print and Thomas declared and confessed his major important faith uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the risen Lord said in that indefinite article, you are the God and the Lord, my Lord and my God, which means again that that is the faith and Jesus said you believe because you have seen blessed are those who did not uh, see me and yet believe and yet we understand that the Lord stayed with the disciples if we take one of the stories that we find in the New Testament he stayed with them for 40 days as written in uh, the Acts of the Apostles that Jesus was appearing and talking to people and encouraging them and ultimately reminding the disciples to go into Galilee so that they can he can see them before his ascension he told them go and tell my uh, disciples that i am going back to my father and your father to my god and my god and when they met and they saw him he ascended in his glorified, resurrected body into the heavenly realm. And this is the faith that we have in the church when we talk about the glorified and resurrected body that we shall assume after death when we are united on the last day with the Lord, with the Lord of uh, our Creator, as we recited in the creed and he shall come again to judge the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end we believe that on the day of the ascension jesus christ sits with his own glorified body the body that he took from the mother of god and this human body is now on the right hand side of the throne of the almighty god the father so that is what we are talking about, the resurrected, glorified body after the resurrection. That Jesus Christ, as we read in the uh, theology of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was making that clear to the heresy of the Docetists and those who, you know, thought that Oh, Christ appeared, appeared as a human person. He was nothing but a ghost or some sort of uh, a spirit. And the Docetists were attacked and, uh, you know, taken by St. Ignatius of Antioch as uh, one of the early heresies of the church. And the important thing, again, you know, to go back to, uh, to, to the original uh, sin, we, we talk about the original sin as something that affected mankind. We do not say that the sin of Adam continues, uh, you know, to, to be inherited from one person to another. We do not inherit sin because sin is something personal. Sin has entered as an original sin through disobedience. There is a sense of rebelliousness by the human person against 
the promises and the love of God, the creator. Original sin comes as stating, as making a wall between the creator and the creatures. And this is because of that disobedience and sense of pride that Adam and Eve wanted to be separated from the graces that God has bestowed upon them, having given Adam the opportunity to name the creatures and to share and to participate in the creation, in the natural creation. That is the reason, which is very important, that when we talk about the incarnation, the purpose of the incarnation is not to create what we consider as being the supernatural. It is not the supernatural element that we gain by the incarnation of our Lord. It is by making that which was abnormal because of sin, now is the opportunity to become normal as was originally created by God from the time of creation. Everything that is natural now becomes as God intended from the time he created the world and created mankind. And that is the reason when we talk about holy water or talk about holy oil or about anything that we do in the church to bring the blessings of the Holy Spirit upon them, we do not say now that the chemicals of the water has changed. It's no longer H2O, it is something else. It is still H2O as was created naturally and normally by God. It is not needed to have something called supernatural. It is by restoring nature to its own after having been distorted because of sin. And that is the reason that if somebody who is sinful and being a human, he belongs to the old Adam, Jesus Christ in the title that is given to him, he is the new Adam. And the mother of God is not the old Eve, she is the new Eve. And that is the kind of typology that we use from the old fulfilled in the New Testament. And therefore, when we talk about, uh, you know, original sin, we consider that it is not the inherited sin from father to son and so forth, because we are responsible ourselves for that uh, state of, uh, of sinfulness. And it is something that uh, we have to uh, overcome that by understanding ourselves and understanding the things what our God has given us to make things natural, the things that is natural that ultimately leads us to our understanding of God. Okay? Okay, Father, th thanks a lot. It's really, really, I enjoyed and learned, uh, learned a lot from your uh, Bible study, uh, and we hope to see you again in uh, other uh, lectures at our Bible study group. And thanks again for your time and for your uh, presentation. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. You can depend on me anytime. And I hope that uh, all the viewers and the hearers uh, were able to, uh, to follow the uh, stages of my presentation and uh, to learn from it. And uh, we are always uh, safe in the Holy Church that whatever we teach is something that we worship. This is connected together. We do not separate our worship from our doctrines and teachings of the church, they both reveal one another. We say uh, uh, be, be because of the faith that is lived in the liturgical life of the church. And I invite all to come and to participate and to be part of this uh, you know, life that is given to us because of the incarnation of our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father. and. Uh... Uh, I want to thank everyone who listens today.
and we promise you we always bring the good topics and uh, the topics that interest it and uh, the one that we need to know to be more close to our faith and to learn more uh, the Christianity, the, the origin of the Christianity and how we have to live our life uh, with Jesus Christ and how to get blessing from uh, the, the learning of his word and to love his word in our life. Thank you, Father, and thank you for your time. And we wish we'll see you thank again you. with the future topics uh, in English Th and in Arabic too. Th Father, oh, only pleasure. one prayer before you finish. Just